Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm sure that more people will join us, but uh, we can start now. Uh, my name is Marta Fernandez de Alarcón. I'm the Secretary General of the Spanish Business Council. And I want to welcome you to this webinar about Saudi Arabia Regional Headquarters Program with one of our members of the chamber, EMLTC. As you may know, EMLTC is a law firm and tax uh, consultancy focus on emerging, uh, emerging markets tailored to the needs of their clients. So we are very pleased to come with them in the chamber. Uh, I am delighted to present today for this webinar these amazing experts uh, from EMLTC today, uh, Dr. Constantine Frank Fail, a founding partner and Anna Conde Associate. And um, I want to say thank you for your collaboration and support. Um, the Spanish Business Council is an international community and although most of our members are Spanish companies, but not all of them are as, as uh, an example of, of our partner of today. And uh, one of our main purposes is, uh, from the chamber is to be an international community. Uh, with all our members, we are creating an amazing platform to share ideas uh, for making networking, to find collaborations and to make businesses uh, in the UAE. So I don't want to rest time to our speakers. Uh, I, I would like to thank all of you for, for joining us today. And uh, at the end of the webinar, we will explore a Q&A with the speakers. And, and let's start uh, the webinar of today. Thank you so much. Okay, right now. So as Marta already pointed out, the MLTC is a low end tax consultancy firm. We uh, advise businesses, entrepreneurs in uh, many different matters, such as market entry localization strategies, business formation, the day-to-day -day management of the companies, contracts, uh, tax regulation, and compliance. We have our own offices in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, but as well in other countries, such as uh, Singapore, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Kenya, in Sri Lanka, and also a network of associated offices in other South Asian and uh, Middle East countries. As we already said, uh, we act as a one-stop service provider since we address the matters from a legal tax and compliance perspective. Let's, uh, I will now just um, introduce you um, to the content of the webinar. I will be the one starting with the introduction itself. Um, I will refer basically to the RHQ definition and then I will move on, on to the, uh, an, an overview of the current status quo in the region and uh, depict a picture of the Saudi Arabia situation. Then I will hand over the webinar to my colleague, Dr. Constantin Frank Fale which will focus his uh, presentation on the regional headquarters regulations himself. So he will be focusing mainly on the uh, controls that have been set by, by Saudi regarding the uh, contracting, um, the contracting with the government agencies in Saudi for uh, companies not having regional headquarters there. And finally, we will raise some conclusions and there will be a Q&A uh, session like Marta said. So let's start. Um, well, everybody knows, or at least uh, uh, it is well known that the UAE has played a leading role as a regional headquarter in the Middle East region. And why is that? What's the reason behind it? Uh, it's because it meets the essential criteria to be a regional headquarter, since it provides access to qualified workforce. It gives access to markets. It has become a great hub for uh, lots of industries and businesses and has actually developed an excellent infrastructure. Maybe some of you know that it has been ranked by the World Bank as a, in the top 16 places as an, in the ease of doing business ranking that they published every year, that was two years ago, which is actually the first one in the region. Uh, businesses also are free to repatriate their capital 
And uh, obviously, from a tax perspective, there's a big advantage since there's no personal income tax, as we all know. And despite the corporate income tax have been recently introduced, it is true, however, that the rate is really low compared to other GCC countries. It's just 9%. And of course, we all, or most of us, uh, like to live in Dubai since this, uh, in the UA, since there's a Western standard of living. So jumping into the definition of the regional headquarters, well, basically, I would say, uh, from a business perspective, it's a central hub within an organization that manages and coordinates all its operations from a specific region. From a legal perspective, we have to stress out an important thing and uh, you have to bear in mind the RHQ regulations themselves, they do not contain a detailed, a specific definition of what an RHQ is. In fact, it just refers to the companies that do not have an address queue. And, um, um, the, but it is true that the Ministry of Invent Investment of Saudi Arabia published last uh, February, in February 2022, a service manual where we can find uh, a definition. But I will not go into these details because that's uh, my colleague, Dr. Constantin Frank Fale, will uh, address this matter. So, what are the common functions of a regional headquarters? You may all uh, know about it, but let's give you a quick, a quick idea. It's uh, basically the coordination and monitoring of the business activities. There's a development of the company strategy. And of course, there's a great deal of uh, management from a human resources perspective, from a financial one, uh, from the standpoint of the stakeholders uh, regarding the supply chain as well. So let's turn to Saudi. What has Saudi done until now? Uh, Sam Saudi has been served very often from Dubai and Abu Dhabi as the economic centers in the region. That is why at a certain point of time, they have uh, put a lot of effort into launching some localization programs uh, to encourage the suppliers to uh, set up their operations in Saudi Arabia instead of supplying from abroad. You may have heard about the ICTIVA program related to the oil and gas, but there are other similar programs, in fact, that were introduced, for instance, by SABIC, which is the Saudi Arabia Basic Industries Corporation. It's a corporation that operates uh, in over more than 50 countries and is related to the um, chemicals, and it launched Fine, uh, programs to provide financial support to SMEs in Saudi. There's also a program that was launched by Madden, another 50% owned company by the government. But what we can see is that uh, until now, there was um, all these programs were mostly uh, sector specific focus. So at the end of the day, we realized that Saudi, until now, they realized and especially um, Riyadh as an economic hub has realized that they have lost uh, their race for the RSQ. So that leads, leads us to the following question. So what to do to face that, uh, that issue? Well, I guess everyone here reads the newspapers and they have read, uh, they have read something about the, or some news about the Vision 2030 in Saudi. So in a nutshell, what is Vision 2030? I would say it's a comprehensive full set of different projects that are aiming to, uh, aiming to provide or to ensure a more diversified and more sustainable economy for, the, uh, for Saudi since the country wants to be less reliable on the oil and gas. Actually, within this frame, 
the kingdom has already performed some liberalizing measures uh, regarding the foreign direct investment and they have actually enabled some companies to be 100% foreign ownership. Uh, to achieve this goal, they also set, put in motion two very major projects. One is called NEOM. Maybe some companies or some uh, that are attending the webinar are involved in this uh, audacious project. The other one is Riyadh 2030. Maybe you know that the Riyadh, you have read that Riyadh 2030 is a candidate city for the 21st Asian Games. So um, let's focus for a little bit on NEOM. NEOM, uh, it's a free zone, it will become a free zone, the size of Belgium in the northwestern side of, the, of Saudi. And uh, it is expected to provide a really competitive legal and tax regime. However, it is true, it still has to be built and the estimated cost of the project is, uh, amounts to $500 billion which is uh, obviously very high. It is, as I said, it is a very ambitious dream uh, for the, to bring a new future to the country. Regarding the vision for Riyadh, um, well, Re Saudi wants Riyadh to become a new great hub for the Middle East, a new, let's say, economic powerhouse in the region. And it has a great asset. It has its own population. The population is uh, over the country is young and it's uh, very wide. Only Riyadh itself, it's uh, approximately 7.5 million people and it's uh, expected to be double in, I would say, no time. And, um, and the government, well, Riyadh plans to attract actually uh, 500 foreign companies to set up their RHQ in the city over the next 10 years. Actually, there's already been 80 for, uh, multinational companies that have already applied and be granted the RHQ license. Doesn't mean they have started yet to uh, operate uh, according to uh, all the necessary requirements related to that, but they have already obtained the license. So what other paths or what has uh, also been done in Saudi Arabia beyond these two major projects that we have uh, referred to? Well, uh, Saudi Arabia, let's say, has gone through a whole breakneck of other transformations uh, like the uh, project of King Abdullah Financial District, a special economic zone in Riyadh. It was actually, it actually started in 2006, but uh, it was not uh, as success successful as they wished. And that is why they have recently changed uh, somehow the focus, which was only financial to, uh, and being transformed, has been transformed into a free zone with a bigger scope. So all the companies that are establishing this financial district will get some special incentives, like uh, very interesting ones, corporate income tax exemption of 0%. So for 50 years, there will be a waiver of Saudization for at least 10 years. Obviously, they will get a fast track of fast processing to get their trade license. They will be able to choose their legal form and, uh, and get the preferential treatment while attending or submitting to public procurement processes. In fact, there is other measures that have already been and that are the, under discussion for quite sometime in other special economic zones in, throughout the country. There's uh, actually four new special economic zones that have been established very recently. It's been announced in, in April this year. In, they are listed here, the Ras Al Khair Special Economic Zone, Cloud Computing Special Economic Zone, King Abdullah Economic City, 
and Jazan. They're all located in, well, as I said here in Riyadh, Jazan, Ras Al Khair, and King Abdullah Economic City. And they are focused on key sectors like advanced manufacturing, medical technology, and cloud computing. Actually, like Jazan, for instance, gives access to the largest port in Saudi Arabia. And they, uh, the companies that will, op will operate in these special economic zones, they will also get uh, specific advantages from a tax perspective, also an exemption from customs. There will be a possibility of holding 100% in uh, of uh, the shares for the foreigners. Um, and other, there are other, another uh, special economic zone that I want to refer quickly is the special integrated logistics zones that was formerly known as integrated logistic bonded zone in Riyadh and which also adopted some support measures like the tax exemption. So, um, now that I have gone through, a, let's say, a quick presentation of the whole landscape in the region, I will leave the floor to my colleague, Dr. Constantin, so he can jump into the next part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for um, putting this into a frame. I will speak about the um, new RHQ reg regulations, which mostly uh, address the matter of public procurement. I'll discuss um, the RHQ definitions within those regulations, but also um, around the Ministry of Investment of Saudi Arabia, the MISA uh, service manual, and how that basically is interlinked. So let's look a, take a look at the history, what happened so far. So in February 2021, Saudi Arabia announced that they will um, roll out an RHQ program, which um, would uh, be built on the notion that uh, suppliers and bidders in public procurement processes would not be allowed to take part in public procurement procedures unless they have a regional headquarter uh, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Back then, uh, there was not much uh, known how this would look in terms of uh, geographical extensions, in terms of what kind of functions there would need to be. Um, a bit later that month, the investment minister gave a um, quite lengthy interview about this topic. Uh, I will refer to this interview uh, every now and then because we see some of the aspects um, they actually um, um, implemented, others they didn't. And then we had the um, publications of the RHQ instructions by the Ministry of Investment a year later, roughly. And last year in December, we had the issuance of the RHQ regulations, which basically are the first piece of legislation that deal with the um, yeah, linking public procurement with a regional presence in Saudi Arabia or the effects of not having one, but having a regional presence somewhere else, such as Abu Dhabi or Dubai. And then of course um, we had, uh, or we will see the full implementation of these RHQ regulations uh, at the 1st of January, 2024. Now, I think this particular slide is the most important slide of this presentation. So um, if you have only listened with one ear uh, so far, maybe it makes sense now to focus your full concentration because I can tell you, if you understand this slide, then um, you basically understand the impact of the RHQ regulations. So we've, we've basically come up with this decision tree where you need to specify and understand whether your business is directly or indirectly involved with the public sector in Saudi Arabia. If the answer is yes, you would need to check whether you have an existing RHQ within the MENA region outside of KSA, unless you already have your uh, RHU in KSA, but I'm assuming that most of you will not have their regional headquarter in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia yet. If the answer is no, meaning you do not have any business with the public sector in Saudi Arabia, the RHQ regulations do not apply. If the answer is no to the second question, you um, do not have an existing uh, RHQ, within the MENA region, that could be Morocco, that could be Egypt, but it could and most likely is the UAE, Abu Dhabi or Dubai, then uh, you would also not 
be falling into the scope of these RHQ regulations? If the answer, however, is yes, the application, the, the, the regulations are applicable to you. And then it's just a question of uh, whether you are subject to an exceptional sort of circumstance. And then again, if no, then you basically, you cannot get a contract um, uh, awarded, generally speaking. If yes, there is an exceptional circumstance, then you can participate in the public tender under uh, the normal circumstances. But I'll get back to these exceptional circumstances and I'll basically go through every single part of the definition of these RHQ regulations as we go along. But again, this decision tree is very important for you to understand whether this whole topic, um, do I need to move my operations to Saudi Arabia? Do I need to move my management to Saudi Arabia? In essence, do I have to incorporate a regional headquarter company or branch in Saudi Arabia? Is it relevant to me or not? So um, we will share the presentation later with the SBC. So um, no need now to take screenshots. You can focus fully on the presentation. So who is basically um, um, going to be targeted by this regulation? It basically includes companies that do not have an RHQ in Saudi Arabia, but do have an RHQ in the MENA region. That's written in Article 1. Um, and it says that contracting authorities, which basically are the public sector, we'll get to the definition in a second as well, are not allowed to conclude, generally speaking, contracts with such companies, but also with related parties. And this is very important because related party is basically extending the scope of this regulation, not only to agents, but also to distributors suppliers and other providers of the goods and services that you might be ultimately selling to a public customer in Saudi Arabia. So again, very important to understand, let's say you have a distributor appointed in Saudi Arabia and your distributor is doing direct business with public government entities or, or government with, with, let's say, governmental bodies. In this case, you would also be affected by this regulation. So it's not only directly, but also indirect business. Who are the contracting authorities? Basically, the regulations um, refer to government agencies, so ministries, authorities, public institutions, or public corporations. At the moment, from what we know, Aramco and Sabic are not covered by the RHQ regulations. In other words, if you do business with Aramco or with Sabic and you do not have any other governmental business, then uh, these regulations are not applicable to you. But of course, keep in mind that other localization uh, rules and programs might affect your business. Anna just named a few like the Ictiva program or the Nusanet program that is run by Sabic. The RHQ regulations are a specific part of the public procurement law and the RHQ regulations basically cover all of the tender procedures, which are the public tender, the limited tender, and also the direct tender procedures. So basically, you have the public procurement law and then these RHQ regulations, which are an add-on to the current public procurement regime. Now, this is probably the most um, important part in terms of um, understanding what you would need to do or what would happen, let's say, if you have an office in Dubai, but you still want to do business in the MENA in, in, the, in the KSA. The question is, how is it def defined? The RHQ de um, regulations itself, they do not include a statutory definition of regional headquarters. And that's quite interesting to see because there are severe legal consequences attached to having an RHQ somewhere outside. And the big problem is if it's not defined, what do you do? So I'm going to basically just cover what else we know in other pieces of sort of legislation, but also in interviews. So important to understand the legislation, the RHQ regulations completely leave it open, whether there needs to be some minimum functions uh, shifted to KSA in order to qualify as a regional headquarter. And equally, this makes it unclear that if the regulations say, well, you don't have an office in Saudi Arabia, but we see somehow that you have an operation in Abu Dhabi or in Dubai, or in Amman or in Casablanca, um, would that qualify automatically as an RHQ? And there's other questions, important questions attached to that. Well, I'll get to, I'll get to that in a second. Now, 
in this interview that I cited earlier in on 22nd of February 2021, the investment minister basically said that they would want to have companies um, have their C-suite there and um, operations in other countries, subsidies, branches reporting to the case, a RHQ and so forth. And they also basically said that, um, yeah, it, it, it shouldn't be a nameplate saying that this is the regional headquarters. So basically you would need to show some substance, you would need to show, show some headcount and, and functions within the RHQ. Now, the initial RHQ guidelines then basically said that the unit of a multinational group should be established under the laws of Saudi Arabia. And now it's important to understand this for the purpose of supporting, managing, and providing strategic direction to its branches, subsidiaries, and affiliates operating in the MENA region. Later on, we got some more qualification from the MISA, Ministry of Investment Service Manual, where they basically now put together the requirements to obtain an RHQ license in Saudi Arabia. And they basically say you have to um, have two mandatory functions, strategic direction and a management function. And then you need to have um, a, at least three op optional RHQ functions from the list here, which could be um, auditing, accounting, legal, HR, training services, et cetera. So three of these functions would need to be shifted or established in Saudi Arabia to obtain a MISA RHQ license. MISA also says that the RHQ needs to be separated, it needs to be a separate legal entity. So let's say you have already an established LLC in Saudi Arabia. The general notion is that you cannot basically uh, add into the operating company an RHQ license. So it would need to be a separate corporate vehicle with a separate legal personality. You would need to show that you have 15 full-time employees employed in the first year. At least three of those should be acting in senior roles and the company must operate in at least two different jurisdictions other than Saudi Arabia and its main headquarters where it is incorporated. And then of course, they will also check that, at least that's what they're saying. You need to have the mandatory two RHQ functions that I've listed earlier that needs to be commenced with, within six months of the uh, license issues issuance and then of course three other ones within one year of the issuance of the license. Now again this definition is not included in the RHQ regulations and there is also no link to how MISA handles the RHQ is the same way as we would handle them under the public procurement law. So there is a direct link missing in order to basically uh, close or fill the gap between how MISA defines an RHQ and how the public procurement law defines the RHQ. And this is quite important, um, yeah, with regard to understanding what the effects are. But before we go there, um, I'm just going to talk about the relevant region. The RHQ regulations basically say that you need to have your Middle East and North Africa uh, region MENA headquarter, regional headquarter in Saudi Arabia. Um, earlier, if you go back to the interview, they said that they would like to have Middle East Africa and parts of Western Asia, I assume South Asia, in particular, maybe even extending uh, to, to obviously uh, countries like Pakistan or Iran, which is Western Asia. Um, but obviously, if you look at now, what, what they did is we're only talking about Middle East and North Africa. So the good news is from a, from a sort of a regional perspective, they've carved out great parts of the world. So what is happening now? How does this sort of mechanism with um, not being able to participate in public procurement because of the circumstance that you do not have a regional headquarter in Saudi Arabia? Well, the Ministry of Investment and Finance, they will compile a list of companies that do not have an RHQ in Saudi Arabia, but do have one in the MENA region. And this list is going to be published on the Unified Electronic Portal for Government Procurement and should be updated quite regularly. So if you, if you look at this, what is happening is a de facto blacklisting where companies are going to be listed that are excluded from public procurement. And the big question is, how are you going to find out whether a company in fact has its 
regional headquarter in, let's say, Dubai or in Morocco, because of course you can basically see, uh, let's say from the company's website, but also from the uh, commercial registries, as far as they are publicly uh, uh, um, accessible, what kind of corporate vehicle somebody has there, but it's gonna be quite harder to understand what kind of functions are located in one of these jurisdictions. Yes, maybe you can ask business, business units or business intelligence people, you know, to, to, to um, scan all of the LinkedIn profiles of the re relevant um, parties that work there and understand, well, there is somebody who does legal or there is somebody who does HR, et cetera. But basically we have two issues here in my view, the one being that it's quite unclear which RHQ definition is going to be used in order to compile that list. Again, the RHQ regulations do not contain such definition. And even if the uh, MISA and Ministry of Finance will basically uh, lean on the MISA service manual definition um, of RHQ, then it is still leaving you with the, info, with the information gap of how do you find this out and who will basically uh, evaluate this. So much is going to be seen basically in practice, um, but this is for me sort of the biggest, the biggest pain points we have right now for all of those who do not have a regional headquarter in Saudi Arabia. Now, the question is, um, once we've gone through the decision tree, even if you fall within the scope and you do not have the regional headquarter in Saudi Arabia, but you might have one somewhere else, there are still some exceptions and those I would like to cover now. Now, they, these, these, these rules uh, include a threshold uh, award, which is 1 million uh, SAR, which is approximately a quarter million euros for basically tenders uh, below or equal to that values, they are excluded from the RHQ regulations. So if you have direct business or indirect business with the government, um, but you know for a fact, look, um, the, the, the volume of these contracts is typically under or below this uh, threshold, you're de facto not going to be affected by this, keeping in mind, obviously, that this threshold can be changed at any time. Um, but then also you have in public tenders um, bidders that can be awarded the contract if uh, there's only your uh, offer that is technically acceptable or your offer is uh, much cheaper than other offers. Um, you also have in limited tenders the possibility that if there is an emergency that you could get an award uh, or there is no more than one qualified competitor other than the bid bidder with no RHQ in KSA. Um, so there are some loopholes to this, but it really depends on your market power, whether you really are um, one of the only providers of such goods or services. And the same basically um, applies to direct awards that are possible if there's uh, only one competitor or there is an emergency situation. There are some additional ways where the contracting authority may submit a request for exemption. Um, but this is a quite formalistic uh, approach, not sure how that will play out in practice. But basically, if you're there in within these sort of um, exceptions, that would be another possibility to do business without RHQ in KSA. Now, there is a most recent uh, interview uh, by the investment minister about um, relevant tax savings, similar to basically what Anna had already discussed with regard to the newly established free zones, where an RHQ can basically um, get tax holidays, et cetera. Now, the big question is usually you don't want to make a lot of profit with a regional headquarter because it's basically just going to charge uh, service fees to the subsidiaries, et cetera. So from a, let's say, operational business perspective, I don't think that is the most uh, interesting part uh, for you or shouldn't be the reason for setting up an RHQ, but at least um, it can give further relief. Of course, then um, when we talk about all of this, you and you, you consider structuring your operations and your headquarter in Saudi Arabia, you need to look at the Saudization requirements uh, in some cases, and it's not entirely clear yet, depending on where you set it up, there might be a Saudization uh, holiday you need to keep in mind also other localization programs, what impact would it have that you basically, let's say have an opco in Saudi Arabia that um, deals with Aramco, has a good ICTIVA score, and now basically 
um, delegate some of its work to another company? Is it going to be good for your Ectiva score? Is it going to be bad for your Ectiva score? How will it affect basically the procurement uh, from within uh, Aramco, et cetera? And then, of course, you need to check um, what other kind of uh, um, 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 adjacent tax issues you might have. Uh, let's say Spanish controlled foreign corporation rules, or if you do not go through Spain or another uh, uh, another another jurisdiction within uh, Europe um, that you have sufficient economic substance, the same would apply, let's say, if you still keep one operation in Dubai and you delegate some of the uh, RHQ uh, services uh, into Dubai and you basically then charge your Saudi Arabian RHQ for that, you would need to have economic substance. Um, so it's, it's quite a complex task that uh, requires the insights of, of, of various um, legal fields, tax is one of them, corporate law, but public procurement and then workforce nationalization. Now with this, I would like to come uh, to the end and um, which also leaves us a couple of minutes for a Q and A session. Um, I think this is quite interesting because Bobby Gosh really said already in, in February, 2021, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are on an economic collision course. And from, from what you've heard from Anna and what you've heard from me, uh, it's clear KSA will no longer tolerate this Dubai model or Abu Dhabi model, which has served as a solid sort of RHQ solution for the longest time. Um, we have all these foreign direct investment barriers sort of uh, decreasing in the region. And we see uh, that, that the competition for investment significantly increases and, 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 and the tone is getting more aggressive. So we've seen it traditionally from all of these local content programs, localization programs, which um, also are not um, mutually uh, recognized. So Saudi tells you to build up export capacities in Saudi Arabia, basically the UAE tell you the same, Qatar tells you the same, um, but if you do that, obviously you're gonna take away business from the other jurisdictions. So it's, it's getting intense and all of this from a Saudi perspective really culminated now in this um, RHQ program. And for me, the most important part really are these RHQ regulations. Um, which then um, are the access point to the public procurement market in KSA. And um, concluding, you would need to uh, verify and, and, and check whether you have any business activities in, in the KSA that fall under these uh, regulations. And for that, you need to identify the relevant contract partners. Who are my customers? Um, am I doing direct business? Am I using a sales channel partner? Is my distributor or my agent doing direct business? So you should, you should make an assessment of that. And based on that, see if you have business, uh, do you have a setup in the MENA region? Do you have an office in Dubai? Do you have an office in Abu Dhabi? Do you have an office in Cairo? What about Casablanca? And could this office potentially be seen as an RHQ under this non-existing RHQ regulation definition? And then the question is how should should I act and how should I position myself if I have something uh, in the MENA region? Yeah, Would it make sense, let's say, if you're a larger company to put the uh, MENA region under Europe or, for example, Singapore, which, as you can see from the map that I showed you, is not within the MENA region? So the outlook question is, how are these regulations going to be handled in practice? Can KSA, and this is also a very important question, handle the necessary or establish the necessary infrastructure to accommodate uh, all of these people that they want to attract? Yeah? If you look at the uh, reports on the housing market right now, looks like there's uh, not sufficient uh, housing for expatriates. If you look at the school capacities, there are not even enough schools to host uh, um, uh, foreign or uh, expatriate kids. Uh, at the moment, so it's it, it's quite it's quite challenging from a legal point of view, but I think also from a practical point of view to get the talent over to Saudi Arabia. And with this, I would like to thank you for your um, interest, and I'm happy um, to take some questions along with uh, Anna. I hope it's not going to be like the Spanish Inquisition, but uh, let's see. I think you're still on mute. Sorry, thank you. We have a question from Christina Mate. Um, the question is, if you have already an entity in 
KSA that intends to engage in the business uh, with government entities. Do you need to establish another entity only for the RHQ? Yeah, that, I mean, it, it depends. The, the question, the question. I think the primary question is, does this company have another company that could qualify as an RHQ within the MENA region? If that's the case, let's say this yeah. company would also have a company in, in Abu Dhabi or something like that. And there is the risk because of the size of the company and what is um, available in terms of public know-how, knowledge, uh, then uh, the answer would be uh, yes, because there's a high risk that such operation would be considered as an RHQ outside of KSA within the MENA region. And then this would basically make necessary in order to uh, take part in the public procurement to establish a separate a separate company. So operational company needs to be separate from the RHQ. That's that's Misa's point of view right now. Thank you. Any more questions? It seems uh, the information was very clear because we don't have any more questions. That's that's it's either it's I always say it's either a good sign or a bad sign. Either we did a very <laughs> terrible presentation. No, I, I believe it's good. It's good because it was really clear. So maybe the, uh, it was a little bit overwhelming with all these questions that have to uh, be raised in our own minds you know, to get. Uh, Okay, the, the thing is that then uh, this webinar will will be uploaded in our YouTube uh, channel. Okay, so all the information, uh, all the people that wants to, to go there to check some information or, you know, they can they can go to our YouTube channel. channel. I believe there's no more questions, I think. Okay. Nothing. Anyway, you can always uh, send us an email, whatever, or yes, we, we're gonna leave you the details. So if you want to reach any of us to get some intel, speak intel, just uh, we advise you to be ready for what's coming. Yeah, and uh, the YouTube channel they are asking you the YouTube channel is a Spanish business council, it's very easy. Okay. But it will be it will be uploaded in some days, not not today. Okay. I think they got a friend with your Inquisition referral. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Okay. So okay. thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.